Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India So hello and welcome to this NPTEL course entitled uh, 20th Century Fiction where we're looking at Joseph Conrad's Heart of Darkness. So from this lecture onwards we'll begin to wind up uh, with this particular text um, having discussed the uh, salient and fundamental features that this text represents and its political importance along with the literary importance that it carries today. So uh, one of the things we have discussed already about Heart of Darkness is the uh, politics of representation, how were things represented in Heart of Darkness the entire style of narration and as we may know by now it's a very complex narrative style i mean it does superficially uh, adhere to classic realism uh, but then it also keeps experiencing uh, uh, the fundamental inadequacies of classic realism when it comes to narrating an experience uh, like this and if you remember the last lecture the point that we stopped uh, where marlowe was admitting his inability he was sort of acknowledging and screaming uh, of the fact that you know he's unable to tell you the story uh, and he kept asking the audience do you see the story uh, can i tell you the story can i convey to you what really happened and of course it was a rhetorical question because he knows very well that he, uh, he he can't do it he can't convey completely what happens in congo and that we discussed how that was how it, the novel represents it, it's sort of foregrounded uh, is um, you know narrative inadequacies and in that sense it's a very quasi postmodern novel Heart of Darkness. So it's one of those novels which are almost everything as late Victorian is definitely modernist. It has lots of stream of consciousness technique uh, and also seems to anticipate a lot of postmodern narrative style in terms of its uh, foregrounding of its narrative inadequacies and unreliability which is sort of innately embedded uh, in that novel and which is connected to the whole sense of centerlessness that Heart of Darkness uh, foregrounds and dramatizes. So, you know, everything about Heart of Darkness is centerless, uh, the narrative is centerless. So Marlowe is the primary narrator, but then he's the first person to acknowledge his um, you know, uh, inability to narrate, his struggle to narrate. Uh, and then we have the characters who are quite centerless as well. There's a degree of hollowness about the characters as well. And uh, we talked about how, in one of the lectures, if you remember, how the hollowness in Heart of Darkness uh, it, it is the combination of spectrality and unknowability. Right. So, and of course, uh, an example of exhaustion as well. So, it's exhaustion, unknowability, and spectrality all put together, which uh, constitutes the hollowness uh, in Heart of Darkness. Um, there is a degree of existential uh, exhaustion. There's a degree of idleness exhaustion. There's no ideas left. There's nothing left uh, to salvage and redeem. Uh, and what is foregrounded, what comes across very heavily, is a naked exploitative uh, machinery of imperialism. There is a completely naked enterprise. There's nothing you can dress up that with. Uh, there's no Christian narrative, there's no civilized narrative, um, there is no missionary, a noble narrative that you can use to redeem the, the exploitative machinery of imperialism. Right? And that's something which Heart of Darkness does very well. And of course, we have to remember, and I have mentioned this already, and I'll repeat myself, that it's about Belgian imperialism. Right? It's not about British imperialism. It's Belgian imperialism in Congo. It's Belgians in the Congo. And the difference between the Belgian imperialism and the British imperialism was fundamentally that, that the Belgians never even attempted uh, to dress up imperialism as some kind of a civilized ambition. I mean, it was very, very nakedly evident that it was a machinery of exploitation. It was very explicit. Uh, there's nothing uh, that even uh, sort of tried to hide or conceal this exploited phase of imperialism, right? So that's the setting that uh, Conrad is describing. That's the setting that Marlowe in the novel is inhabiting. Now, in this lecture, we'll start with Marlowe's first glimpse of goods. Uh, how does he first see goods? And again, we've seen already how uh, the novel is actually quite cinematic in quality. There's a lot of close-up technique uh, and there's also a lot of defamiliarizing technique, right? So defamiliarization and delayed decoding of things which we have discussed already. Uh, and both techniques, they contribute to the complex visual narrative in Heart of Darkness, the complex visual grammar in Heart of Darkness. And that's important for us to understand because, you know, the whole novel is narrated to us uh, through a certain focus point, a certain focalized point. And Marlowe is a focalized perspective, the focalized viewpoint through which we get to see what happened in the Congo. 
And of course, Marlow is, uh, he's a very unreliable focal point. And that unreliability of Marlow, it gets translated, it gets uh, accounted for in the novel as well, because the entire novel then becomes uh, very, very mysterious and cryptic. So we, as readers, we share uh, the defamiliarization of the Marlow experience. We share uh, the entire delay decoding the Marlow experience. I mean, even we as readers, we can't quite decode uh, what happens in Howl of Darkness. So that delayed decoding, that defamiliarization, uh, all that gets uh, spilled over uh, from Marlowe's experiential frame into the narrative frame that we inhabit. So the narrative frame in Howl of Darkness is one in which delayed decoding and defamiliarization are embedded, innately embedded. Okay, that's something which we keep saying as readers in Howl of Darkness. And I think I mentioned uh, one of my articles uh, on how to darkness, if you if you wish to read more on uh, a more complex arguments about delayed decoding, storytelling, and existential exhaustion, there's an article of mine which got published in a journal called Janus Head, which you can download for free if you just Google up my name. Uh, I have it uploaded in my academic or edu website, so you can download that from free. And if you still have problems downloading it, uh, do mention that in the NPTEL forum that we have uh, in this course, and my TAs can uh, upload it for you uh, to read. Okay. Now let's take a look at the section which should be on the screen where Marlowe sees Kurtz for the first time and he's narrating the experience of seeing Kurtz for the first time. So this should be on the screen. I'm just going to read out the lines first. As to me, I seemed to see Kurtz for the first time. It was a distinct glimpse. Uh, the dugout, four paddling savages and a lone white man turning his back suddenly on the headquarters. Uh, yon relief, yon on thoughts of home, perhaps setting uh, his face towards the depth of the wilderness towards this empty and desolate station. Now this particular phrase, I'm just going to pick up on this a little bit and expand on it. The lone white man turning his back suddenly on the headquarters. So this is a literal description, a physical description of Kurtz's physical movement, but this also becomes very quickly a symbolic movement, right? So Kurtz is a lonely white man who turns his back suddenly on the headquarters. So he is basically what we call in spy fiction and spy cinema today, uh, a rogue agent, right? So someone who turns his back uh, on the machinery which had historically created him, right? So Kurtz is one of the first examples in uh, British fiction uh, on rogue agents. So he's an agent of imperialism. He's someone which, uh, who imperialism constructed. So we're told over and over again that he was a finest soldier of imperialism. He was a finest uh, engineered product of imperialism. But this product, the soldier of imperialism, has now turned broke, has now turned his back uh, to the entire machinery which had historically created him. Uh, and now it's become a problem uh, to the machinery which had created him and now the machinery has to get rid of him. So you can see how how the darkness is such uh, interesting and deep resonance with some of the geopolitical tensions we have in the world today where, you know, great soldiers and great friends, great machinery suddenly become rogue suddenly become terrorists. And the entire ontology of terrorism, the entire ontology of rogue agency uh, is something which is very complex because what that often means is uh, you create, the system creates a, a, a body or a wing or an individual as for a particular purpose uh, to defeat the enemy, etc. And then at some point in historical time later, subsequent to that point, uh, the, that particular individual, that particular agency, that particular uh, wing, it turns rogue. It turns this back on the system which has created it, and now it's that, and then it's branded as a terrorist wing. So the entire idea of terrorism and rogue agency is something which is obviously very geopolitically contingent. And How the Darkness seems to be one of the early novels which anticipates such a geopolitical crisis, right? So we have this uh, Belgian, uh, you know, colony in Congo, uh, an outpost. Uh, and Kurtz happens to be, uh, you know, this finest agent of the empire, the Belgian empire, who has now, uh, ironically, become a problem for the empire, has become a problem for the machinery, and so the machinery has to get rid of him. And if you take a look at the film uh, based on this novel, Apocalypse Now, uh, which is about the Vietnam War, uh, American Vietnam War, there too, Colonel Kurtz, who's played by Marlon Brando, I think I mentioned this already, uh, he becomes a rogue agent uh, who has to be um, terminated, who has to be assassinated. Okay. <clears throat> So this particular image is very, very, uh, you know, telling uh, and symbolic. The lone white man turning his back suddenly on the headquarters. Okay, so I did not know uh, the motive. Perhaps he was just simply a fine fellow who stuck to his work for his own sake. His name, you understand, had not been pronounced once. He was that man. So he becomes, in a way, uh, Kurtz becomes a center in Heart of Darkness. But then once Marlowe arrives at the center, he finds Kurtz to be a hollow man. And this is obviously in connection to the hollowness of 
uh, the center in heart of darkness or the centerlessness in heart of darkness as you would put it. The half caste uh, who as far as I could see had conducted a difficult trip with great prudence and pluck was invariably alluded to as that scoundrel. The scoundrel had reported that a man had been very ill, so we get reports that Kurtz had been very ill, had recovered imperfectly. The two below the me moved away from them a few paces and strolled back and forth at the same distance. I heard military posts, doctor 200 miles, quite alone now, unavoidable delays, nine months, no news, strange rumors. So look at again uh, the randomness in information. Um, Again, among other things, heart of darkness is also about the crisis of information. And you know, as we know, that information or the informative network or the economy of information is something which consolidated, something which is central uh, to the structure of imperialism. So when that gets, um, you know, that becomes a crisis and obviously the entire uh, imperial machinery collapses. Uh, so if we don't get ad adequate information, if we don't get enough information on, how, on, on imperialism, the entire imperial machinery collapses. So the randomness of information, I mean, if you take a look at this phrase, military post, doctor, 200 miles, quite alone now, unavoidable delays, nine months, no news, strange rumors, it's all non-interconnected. Right, so this non-interconnected quality of information, how to darkness is important for us to uh, pick on and, and study. Okay, and then you know uh, the whole idea of stations in imperialism becomes important, and this particular description of stations is telling because uh, Malu is told that each station should be like a beacon on the road to us better things, a center for trade, of course, but also for humanizing, improving, instructing. Right? So again, uh, that's the ideal definition of colonial centers, that you know, it should be the perfect center, the perfect relay station where things get better, where things come in and move out, right? And then uh, between the point of coming in, between the point of arrival and the point of departure, things should become significantly better, right? That's the whole idea of a center. And also this entire humanizing narrative, it should also become one of humanizing, improving, instructing. Okay, and, uh, and that's the whole point. The whole, that's the whole point of a center. The whole point of uh, uh, the colonial machinery that it expo that it's supposed to be efficient as well as humanizing in the first place. And and Hallow Darkness shows how the humanizing phase goes away completely, but also the efficiency phase goes away completely. Right? It becomes inefficient uh, in the machinery, and that's something which Hallow Darkness constantly foregrounds. And that that foregrounding is of course uh, uh, done through. Uh, 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 the whole process of narrative imperfection, right? So the idea that uh, narrative becomes inadequate, uh, uninformative is also reflective of the inadequate and uninformative quality of imperialism in the first place. So the narrative uh, crisis in Heart of Darkness, and the narrative crisis in, in Marlowe's structure is reflective uh, in some sense of the, uh, the existential and political crisis in Heart of Darkness, that it doesn't quite work out. Uh, the entire uh, imperial station, uh, station and machinery doesn't quite work out. And that delay, that interruption in information, uh, the fact that it becomes, um, you know, informatively interruptive. Uh, so that interruptive quality, uh, it spills over in, in Mahler's storytelling as well. It constantly gets interrupted. It interrupts itself. So it's designed to interrupt itself all the time. So in that sense, it becomes a very complex uh, narrative strategy, uh, which is sort of designed to be self-interruptive, right? So self-destructive and self-interruptive. Uh, these qualities inform the narrative uh, politics and heart of darkness consistently. Okay, now what I'm going to spend some time on now is looking at how Malo describes the entire journey down Congo and again we see how uh, the natural landscape uh, gets blurred away uh, quite interestingly and what we get instead is the perception of the landscape and this is what one of the things that you know, Heart of Darkness does very well and uh, yeah, in that sense it's very very modernist how the palpable known material reality becomes secondary. And what becomes primary, what becomes foregrounded is the perception of the reality. So the perception is mapped onto the reality. So we get a perception first and only much later, when, once we navigate through the perceptions, do we get to know what the real thing is, right? So we get, to, we get a very blurry, cryptic image of forests, of rivers, of natural landscapes. And what we, what we get in overabundance, we, we get an overload of sensory perceptions. So perception uh, is foregrounded in Heart of Darkness. The perception becomes more important than information. I think that's a very short, quick way to put it. So perception becomes more important than information. So the informative reality or the informative materiality in Heart of Darkness comes much later, if, if it comes at all. Uh, and what we get instead, uh, an overload of sensory perception, that becomes an important thing for us to understand as readers. Now, if we take a look at this description in Heart of Darkness, 
uh, it becomes important, it becomes interesting for us and that does sort of grasp that captures the entire uh, centerless quality of Marlowe's experience and the centerless quality of his narrative as well. And this is what uh, Marlowe describes the river as and this should be on his screen. Going up that river was like traveling back uh, to the earliest beginnings of the world. It's almost like a temporal thing. So again, look at the way in which space and time are mapped onto each other. The river is a space, a physical space. But the journey along the river, the journey down that river, uh, it becomes a temporal journey, not so much a spatial journey. So that becomes a very complex blurring of spatial and temporal parameters. So we don't go and make out what's when once the spatial parameter ends and the temporal parameter begins. I mean, it's like the same thing. It's like a stream of consciousness. So quite literally, uh, Congo and Heart of Darkness becomes a stream of consciousness. Okay. So it's like a journey back in time, the beginnings of the world, when vegetation rioted on the earth and the big trees were kings, an empty stream, a great silence, an impenetrable forest, the air was warm, thick, heavy, sluggish. So again, look at the uh, adjectives, warm, thick, heavy, sluggish. There's no joy in the brilliance of sunshine. The long stretches of the waterway ran on, deserted into the gleam of overshadowed distances. On silvery sandbanks, hippos and alligators sun themselves side by side. So interestingly, the only animals we see in uh, Heart of Darkness are hippos and alligators. We don't see other wild animals. Again, uh, the material wildness of Africa, the physical wildness of Africa gets overshadowed uh, by the perception of that wildness. Okay, that, that becomes important. So only uh, animals who appear in Heart of Darkness are almost apologies for animals, uh, hippos and alligators uh, and not the uh, you know, the central animals which we associate Africa with, okay. Uh, so, hippos and animals, uh, hippos and alligators, sorry, sun themselves side by side. So, there is a degree of sluggishness uh, which is represented by the hippo image uh, and the alligator sunning themselves again becomes an image of sluggishness, uh, not of movement, not of dynamism. So, everything decelerates, everything gets defamiliarized. So, this deceleration, defamiliarization, uh, these become very important uh, qualities in Heart of Darkness, especially the way uh, the story is narrated to us. The broadening water flowed through a mob of wooded islands. You lost your way on the river as you would in a desert and, and butted all way all day long against shoals trying to find the channel till you thought yourself bewitched and cut off forever from everything you had known once somewhere far away in another existence perhaps. So again, uh, this the whole experience of being cut off, being alienated from everything you had known once, once upon a time. So that existential alienation uh, becomes obviously a response to the material world around you and that becomes uh, part of the package of defemorization. The fact that Mother doesn't quite know, uh, everything around him changes, sort of the world that he knows, the reality he knows changes dramatically and drastically. And that becomes a defemorizing technique in Heart of Darkness. Uh, and the familiar world defemorizes, it becomes strange. You feel alienated uh, as an individual, as a human subject in that fast and dramatically defemorizing world around you. Okay. There were moments when one's past came back to one, uh, as it will sometimes when you have not a moment to spare for, himself, for yourself, but it came in the shape of an unrestful and noisy dream, uh, remembered with wonder amongst an overwhelming uh, realities of this strange world of plants and water and silence. So this dreamlike quality uh, in How the Darkness is important. So an, and dream, of course, is an interesting uh, phenomenon because a dream is a liminal location between reality and fantasy. So, a dream is when a dream is sort of asleep as well as not quite asleep, right? You, you're moving, you have a physical connect to a certain extent. As for instance, if you have a nightmare, you sweat, uh, you become disturbed at a very visceral level when you have a bad dream. So, dream is a liminal location between reality and unreality, between consciousness and unconsciousness, right? So, dream is a subconscious state which becomes important, okay. So, the entire idea of dream becomes important and how this dream informed the narrative politics and how the darkness because as I just mentioned, it's a liminal location between uh, conscious and unconscious and that, that, that liminality of the dream is important for us because Marlowe is inhabiting a liminal landscape where he doesn't quite know what's around him but at the same time, he's not unconscious. He's conscious but at the same time, he's not aware of what's happening around him. So, that, that degree of grayness is very much there in how the darkness, okay. Uh, so, that, that becomes an important thing, that becomes something that Marlowe is uh, obviously uh, grasping, he's struggling to grasp, struggling to navigate. So, 
navigation becomes interesting because literally he's navigating his journey down a river, uh, the Congo River, but at the same time he's navigating with the world around him, uh, the level of perception, the level of knowledge, the level of cognition. So it's more, it's, it's a combination of cognitive navigation as well as physical navigation, right? So that, that combination is interesting and something we should pay some attention to. Okay, so um, text about, talks about the metaphysical reality of this uh, ex experience and then he says and this should be on the screen, when you have to attend to things of that sort, the whole idea of not knowing what, what's around you, that sort, to the mere incidents of the surface, the reality, the reality I tell you fades, the inner truth is hidden, luckily, luckily. So again, the whole idea of centerlessness becomes important, the inner truth is hidden, uh, it's concealed. So the centerlessness of uh, the experience becomes important, it's concealed, it's not something which comes out uh, you know, on the surface. But I felt it all the same, I felt often this mysterious stillness watching me at my monkey tricks, uh, just as watch as you fellas performing on your respective tight ropes for what it is, a half crown, a tumble. So again, uh, and this is something which uh, is interesting because mal uh, out of darkness in that sense is quite resonant, is quite uh, interestingly located. Uh, you know, and dialoguing with some of the PTSD uh, narratives that we have today. Like, for instance, if you take a look at a novel like Yellow Birds by Kevin Powers, which is about the Iraq War, and it's about a U.S. veteran coming back from the Iraq War and finding the entire civilian life around them extremely strange, uh, extremely uncanny. So, in that sense, Marlo is like a war veteran. He's come back from a war site and he's trying to tell the story of what happened in the war to fellow civilians, but he can't tell it. First of all, he can't capture in narrative what really happened to him and secondly he, he has a very flippant and dismissive view of reality in a western civilian space because he's been to another space which is non-western non-civilian in a western sense and he has had he has internalized he was consumed to a certain extent the uncanny quality of that landscape now he comes back to the civilian space and he finds the entire business of making money half crown a tumble which is about making petty money into petty jobs he finds the entire business of that very flippant and very very uh, insignificant in quality. And this take uh, on reality uh, in a western sense, in a western civilian sense, this very dismissive take is something which we have to pay some attention to as readers. Okay, so um, and then uh, the only instance uh, in, in the novel where uh, the response from one of the listeners in How to Darkness is uh, someone telling Marlowe, try to be civil Marlowe, growled a voice and I knew that there was at least one listener awake besides himself. So, we cut back to the storytelling time uh, because we, uh, it's very temporally complicated and complex narrative as well because Marlowe is obviously going back in time to tell you the story of what happened to him in Congo but then the present time in which the story is happening is in London, is in Thames, uh, in a river in Thames called Nelly as we saw in the beginning of the novel and then this is a very abrupt cut back into the time and there's one voice uh, which tells Marlowe to be civil, not to insult uh, the Londoners so much, not to insult the white civilization so much, just because he's been to a non-white space and he's been told that try to be civil, Marlowe growled a voice and I knew and I obviously is an unnamed narrator, uh, the, the, the meta narrator in Heart of Darkness as it were because there are different levels in narration in Heart of Darkness, there's a meta narrator who's listened to Marlowe's story and then it's Marlowe telling the story and there's narrators inside Marlowe's story as well, okay. So the meta narrator tells us there's another person awake and uh, I knew that there was at least one listener awake besides myself, so at least one more guy is still up. Okay, and then Marlowe carries on with the cynicism and the cynical quality of Marlowe is interesting because that is obviously connected to the exhausted masculinity that Marlowe embodies, right? So, it's, uh, this exhausted, liquidated, uh, imperial masculinity that Marlowe embodies and he, all he can do is now being cynical uh, to the entire knowledge of imperialism, the entire glamour of imperialism and the entire machinery of imperialism and he's sort of uh, telling this person that, I beg your pardon, I forgot the heartache which makes up the rest of the price and indeed what, uh, what does the price matter, the trick be well done. You do your tricks very well and I didn't do badly either since I managed not to sink that steamboat on my first trip. It's a wonder to me yet. Imagine a blindfolded man set to drive a van over a bad road and I like this image a lot. Uh, this is the reason why I am picking on it. Uh, Marlowe is attempting to give you a civilian analogy, right, an urban analogy of what happened to him in Congo and this is almost funny uh, dark humor, uh, dark humorous analogy that he's offering at the moment. So, he's saying uh, let me try, let me attempt uh, to give an idea of what I experienced in Congo when I was trying to sail a steamboat not knowing, not having any idea what I'm navigating through, whether it's a forest or it's a whirlpool 
oh, there's you know, people attacking us or pelting us with stones or there's a boulder in the middle of the stream. I had no idea of the reality around me. And I somehow managed to not sink the boat, which is, I think, something of a miracle. And then he's trying to capture that uh, with an analogy or convey that with an analogy that using uh, urban markets. And this is what he offers. Imagine a blindfolded man set to drive a van over a bad road. So if you're a Londoner, I'm giving you a London uh, um, urban market. So imagine someone blindfolds you and asks you to drive up a van on, on a bad road and you manage to do it without crashing it, without hitting something. So it was that kind of a miracle that I experienced in the heart of darkness in, in Congo. I sweated and shivered over the business uh, considerably, I can tell you. Uh, after all, for a seaman to scrape the bottom of that thing that's supposed to float all the time under his care is an unpardonable sin. No one may know of it, but you can never forget a thump, eh? a blow on the very heart. You remember it, you dream of it, and you wake up at night and think of it years after and go hot and cold all over. So he's saying, I'm a professional seaman. Uh, the worst feeling you can get is your, your vessel hitting a surface, hitting the, the bank, hitting a stone. And that, that, the sound is almost visceral in quality. Uh, it, it haunts you forever. It keeps coming back to you all the time. Okay. Uh, and now, again, I just want to spend some time on the whole idea of imperialism, the whole signifier of imperialism in How the Darkness, which in the case of Belgian imperialism in Congo is ivory. Because the whole idea of Belgian imperialism in Congo was the ivory trade, the fact that it was trading on ivory. Uh, and of course, that was being shipped back uh, in massive proportions, in massive business. And uh, it was sold in very high prices in, in Europe. And we saw then how in the European domestic space is full of ivory. So the ivory is a domesticated Africa. Uh, ivory is Africa turned into something which is consumable, something which has a price tag to it, something which is a privileged possession of the white people, right? And this is what uh, Marlo, this is how Marlo describes ivory over here. The word ivory would ring in the air for a while and on we went again into the silence uh, along empty reaches around the still bends between the high walls of a winding way reverberating the hollow claps, reverberating in hollow claps, the ponderous beat of the stern wheel. So again, the centerlessness of the imperial signifier is important for us to understand. So it would just hang in the air like a hollow word, the word ivory. Uh, it will ring in the air for a while and then we'll forget about it and move on. Uh, and you know, we'll just consume the reverberations that will be around us all the time. The hollowness, the hollow sounds, the hollow claps in the ponderous beat of the stern wheel. So again, even the acoustic politics in Heart of Darkness is that of hollowness. It's not really solid sound. It's not really the sound of something solid ringing on. It's something uh, the lack of solidity, the lack of centered, centered quality in Heart of Darkness is sp spills over even in the acoustic frame. Right? So even the acoustic frame Marlon inhabits, the sound frame, the soundscape, so to say, uh, in Heart of Darkness, that too has hollowness embedded in it. Okay? That becomes an important thing. Okay, so, uh, and that's something which uh, you know, Marlon describes uh, over and over again. Right? And then of course we see the whole idea of the steamer toiling on uh, you know, and that whole idea of streamer toiled along slowly on the edge of the black and incomprehensible frenzies, right? So the word frenzy is important, it's, you know, it's something of an irrational behavior. And so, you know, if you take a look at the adjectives in Heart of Darkness, especially the ones which you use to describe Congo, uh, the very exotic adjectives, of course, and that obviously betrays the uh, Eurocentric quality in Heart of Darkness and the racist quality in Heart of Darkness. That it just completely essentializes Africa uh, as a dark continent, uh, as something which cannot be known, cannot be comprehended, cannot be grasped with reality. Uh, but at the same time, uh, what it also does in uh, Heart of Darkness is that it doesn't glamorize uh, the European invasion. It doesn't glamorize the uh, European territorialization. So it becomes a very really de-glamorized, decadent, exhausted uh, description, an exhausted experience uh, that is being, uh, you know, foreground and heart of darkness. Okay, so, uh, and then of course there is a degree of uh, spectrality uh, in the entire experience and that, that spectrality, the phantom quality comes back over and over again and this is what Marlow says, this should be on the screen. Uh, we were cut off from the comprehension of our surroundings, so you know, it's completely comprehensionless. There's no understanding of the reality around you. We glided past the phantoms, wondering and secretly appalled a sane man would be before an enthusiastic outbreak in a madhouse, right? So it's like an outbreak about to happen. It's about a madhouse about to break loose. Uh, and that, that becomes a very important experience. That becomes a very important uh, quality in Heart of Darkness. There is, there's a degree of inertia, a degree of weight 
before madness began. And everyone was waiting for that destruction to begin. Everyone was waiting for the madness to begin. And that wait becomes an important uh, temporal quality in Heart of Darkness. So the entire novel becomes a wait for something to happen. Of course, nothing happens in Heart of Darkness. Uh, you know, Kuz dies and the other novel, Mother comes back. Uh, nothing action-packed uh, takes place at all. But what exhausts uh, Mild and Heart of Darkness, what exhausts us as readers in Heart of Darkness is not the action-packed quality, it's a lack of action. Uh, it's an introspective quality. You just keep, get, keep getting bombarded with uh, sensory perceptions. There's an overload of sensory perception that we get in Heart of Darkness. Uh, nothing happens, no activities take place, no materiality emerges in a solid, signified thing. And so we get is a sense perception, the, the overload of sensory perception which exhausts us as readers. Right? So even Reading Heart of Darkness, uh, to a certain extent, uh, it generates exhaustion, it produces exhaustion and we as readers are exhausted uh, reading this entire overload of sensory perception that Marlowe offers us over and over again. Okay, so uh, we could not understand because we were too far and could not remember because we were traveling on the night of the first uh, ages or those ages that are gone, leaving hardly a sign and no memories. Right? So, it's almost like you're going back in time uh, to a particular stretch of time uh, that can have no memory. So, it's, it's like a prehistoric time uh, because you know, if, you, if you correspond history with memory, uh, something which you remember, something which is factual, something which will have, let's say, uh, the flag bearers of factuality, signposts of, uh, of uh, factuality, that stretch of time, that quality of time is gone completely in Heart of Darkness. And so, what we have is a prehistoric time something which we uh, see about can't quite comprehend and that lack of comprehension in how the darkness becomes an important quality. Okay, so um, and that's something which uh, uh, how the darkness keeps uh, foregrounding all the time. Okay, now uh, I'm going to end this lecture today with a, with a little image, with a little session, uh, a description that is important because it directly corresponds to what I just talked about delay decoding and the whole idea of not knowing what's around you. So, this is the, uh, the, the point in Heart of Darkness where Marlowe's boat gets attacked by uh, the people around uh, uh, the banks and they, they started uh, attacking Marlowe's boat. But again, look at the way in which Marlowe describes it, not knowing uh, what actually took place. And in, interestingly, uh, the confusion of Marlowe, the cognitive confusion of Marlowe, which he had at that point of time, is retained in the narrative. That's an important thing. So, Marlowe obviously got to know what was attacking him uh, later, obviously got to know how the attack was made. But it doesn't bother to tell you that when he's telling the story. So he retains the original confusion. He retains the original cognitive crisis, and that becomes part of the narrative strategy in *Heart of Darkness*. So, uh, so this is the phase, uh, and this is a classic example in, in delayed decoding in *Heart of Darkness*, uh, because then you know uh, that that tells us how the object, the material signifier, comes much later and what comes, uh, what, what becomes foregrounded, what is overabundant and rampant is the sensory perception. Uh, so, this is, uh, this should be on the screen and this is how Marlowe describes the entire uh, experience. I had to look at the river mighty quick because there was a snag in the fairway. Sticks, little sticks were flying about, thick, they were whizzing before my nose, dropping below me, striking behind me against my pilot house. All this time the river, the shore, the woods were very quiet perfectly quiet. I could only hear the heavy splashing thump of the stern wheel and the patter of those things, these things. We cleared the snack, snack clumsily. Arrows by joke, we were being shot at. I stepped in quickly to close the shutter on the land side. That fool hemsman, his hand on the spokes, was lifting his knees high, stamping his feet, champing his mouth like a rein and horse. Confound him, and we were staggering within ten feet of the bank. I had to lean right to swing the heavy shutter, and I saw a face among the leaves on the level with my own, looking at me very fierce and steady. And then suddenly, as though a veil had been removed from my eyes, I made out, deep in the tangled gloom, naked breasts, arms, legs, glaring eyes. The bush, bush was swarming with humans. Now, what is interesting uh, is that how the whole knowledge, the fact that they were being attacked by arrows, that comes much, much, much later. And the sensory perception, the fact that uh, they were being attacked, uh, you know, he finds, he first describes it was a sticks and he sees sticks all around him, he's surrounded by sticks uh, and there's a splash uh, around him and everything was quiet, it's just that this arrow, this rain of sticks coming at him and only much later he does he manage to decode what's actually happening. So, this example of delayed decoding. So, 
by delay decoding what, what Marlowe does and what Conrad does obviously as a, as a writer is that he gives you the sensory perception, the cognitive confusion and only much later as you navigate through the confusion do you get to know what actually is happening. So this point when Marlowe says arrows by Joe we are being shot at that is the arrival of knowledge, arrival at knowledge. He arrives at the knowledge that we are being attacked by arrows. But look at the a series of descriptions before that when he says sticks, little sticks were flying about, thick, they were first whizzing before my nose, dropping below me, striking behind me against my pilot house. So this is the only uh, action scene in Heart of Darkness, right? And also, I mean, just look at the way in which this action scene is defemorized and, you know, and delayed uh, and decelerated before us. So then everything happens in slowed motion, right? And that again is part of the cinematic quality in Heart of Darkness narration. The fact that it uses all these cinematic qualities like slow motion, magnification, uh, panoramic shot, long shot, uh, close up, everything, all the cinematic techniques uh, are used quite rampantly in Heart of Darkness. So, and it is also a time when cinema was coming up. Uh, so maybe Conrad didn't do it deliberately, but it definitely has some resonances with some of the uh, you know cinematic things that you know would come up uh, in, a, in decades of time. But you know this point, and I'm going to end with this uh, this lecture on this particular point. The whole idea of not knowing what's happening around you, and the whole idea of retaining that unknowability, the retain the cryptic quality of cognition, uh, is what makes *Out of Darkness* uh, a very complex narrative. Right? So, it retains the confusion, it retains the original moment of confusion, it retains the original experience of confusion. It does not clear away the things and tell you later in retrospect what happened. So, it the same temporal quality of cognition is retained. So, Marlowe first felt that there were sticks all around him, Marlowe first felt there were showers around him and only much later did he find out there were arrows. So, that temporal quality of first being confused and then not confused and then knowing what is actually happening, that temporal structure is retained even in a retrospective narration. He does not tell you right away those are arrows and then tells you he felt like it. So, he gives it a feeling first just like he did, just like experience it. And that authenticity of experience is something which Heart of Darkness does quite well. It maps the original experience into the retrospective narrative. So, the original experience is mapped, it is something that is foregrounded, it does not uh, it does not get it does not do away with that at all. So, that originality of experience, uh, the authentic original experience is mapped onto the retrospective narration which is something the Heart of Darkness does quite well. And then he says it gives a very graphic description of uh, quote unquote African bodies, naked African bodies uh, and then he says it was a human limbs and movement glistening of bronze colour. So, again these are very problematic descriptions, it is obviously essentializing and commodifying and reifying and objectifying the African body uh, as any white man would at that point of time. But also what makes it interesting is the fact that it does not really look at the body as an evil body, it does not really look at the body as something which is completely uh, you know uh, evil or you know wicked uh, completely. So, that evil quality, the wicked quality is actually attributed to the white body, the white uh, you know the civilization as well. The twigs shook, swayed and rustled, the arrows flew out of them and then the shutter came too. Steer her straight, I said to the hemsman, he held his head rigid face forward, but his eyes rolled, he kept on lifting and, and setting down his feet gently, his mouth formed a little, keep quiet I said in a fury, I might just as well have ordered a tree not to sway in the wind. I darted out, below me was a grave scuffle of feet on an iron deck, confused exclamations, a voice screamed, can you turn back? I caught self a v-shaped ripple on the water ahead, what another snag? So, again uh, look at the way in which everything gets confused, a snag coming up, there is a whirlpool coming up, you can see a v-shaped thing coming up in the water which means it is either whirlpool or a snag. A fusillade burst out under my feet, the pilgrims had opened with their wind gestures, so they started firing as well, the white pilgrims uh, and they were simply squirting led into that bush. A deuce of a lot of smoke came out and drove slowly forward. I swore at it, now I could not see the ripple or the snag either. I stood in the doorway peering and the arrows came and swarmed, so they are constantly being uh, shot at. They might have been poisoned, but they looked as though they could not they would not kill a cat. The bush began to howl, a woodcutters raised a war like whoop, the report of a rifle just at my back deafened me, I glanced over my shoulder and the pilot house was yet full of noise and smoke when I made a dash at the wheel. So, uh, you know the whole exclamation, uh, the whole uh, uh, activity over here 
uh, is a cryptic activity, is a confused activity and that uh, becomes very much a part of the experiential confusion of the darkness which informs the narrative confusion and like I said uh, the original uh, confusion, the original moment of confusion, the original movement from confusion to knowledge that temporal structures retain in the retrospective narration as well and that is something which Shadow Darkness does. So, the entire action packed scene over here where Malus Tima gets attacked by a bunch of arrows uh, by people around uh, along the banks who start firing arrows at them is described in very graphic and sensory details and also very cryptic condition, very cryptic cognitive condition. Uh, which prevents us from knowing what is really happening. So, that original moment of Marlon not knowing is shared with us as readers as well. So, we as readers, we feel as if we are on the board as well because we do not quite know what is happening as well. So, that, that immersive quality in Heart of Darkness is important uh, and I am going to end the lecture here at this point. So, it becomes immersive and that immersive quality is achieved uh, through a process of dramatic defamiliarization. So, everything is defamiliarized, everything is decelerated, uh, everything slows down and hence decelerates and, and that delayed decoding, the fact that you cannot decode what is happening around you, that gives, that contributes or that generates the immersive quality in Heart of Darkness narration. So, I will stop at this point today and I will conclude uh, this text in the next lectures to come. Thank you for your attention.